welcome back. Class time continues with home economics for grade 11. I'm Lydia Dunn and today we'll be looking at the principles of cooking. Let's begin. So on the screen, you'll see our objectives. So at the end of this lesson, students should understand the scientific principles involved in preparing and cooking food. And we have three specific objectives where you're going to define related terms to principles of cooking, and you're going to outline reasons for cooking food, and then you're going to be able to explain the principles underlining the moist and dry heat method of cooking food. And our outline or subtopics, we would say in school, is we're gonna define related terms, we are going to look at reasons for cooking, and we are going to look at principles underlining moist and dry heat. But before you actually begin learning, I want to introduce you to a KWL chart. Now, this chart is a teaching strategy that teachers would use during the face-to-face -face sessions. Now, I encourage every single student to employ this strategy every time you're learning a new topic. What does KWL mean? It's what you already know, what you want to know, and what you have learned. This is just a graphical or a tabulated representation of what it is that you have learned in today's session or any session for that matter. So this is how it will work. You'll go back to your content. This, is, this would be the subheading. So you look at the definition related um, to define related terms, the reasons for cooking food, the principles underlining moist and dry heat. And from these, topics or subheadings per se, you look at what is it I already know about this? What is it I want to know about this? And then at the end of the lesson, you'd self-evaluate what is it that I have learned? So let's just do a little example. What I already know. Suppose you already know what the definition of cooking is or anything related to it. You'd fill it out in the first slot. What I already know. What I want to know. All right, I know the definition, but I don't know the principle. So I want to know what the principle is. And then at the end of the lesson, you'd fill in what is it that you have learned. If you have indeed answered what it is that you wanted to know. So I'm gonna encourage you, even if you don't have this chart written up officially, make notations in your book, write the topic, what you know, what you want to know. And at the end of the lesson, when you're assessing yourself, what is it that you have learned? In any topic, in any lesson that you're going to learn for the first time, even if it's a, a continuation lesson, you have to start at the foundation. Foundations tend to be definitions. Ask yourself, what exactly is this all about? What is cooking? And how exactly does it work? That way, you'll take yourself from the known to the unknown. So we start at the foundation and the foundation is very integral because with the foundation, they know you're going to apply it to what you don't know. So let's see what exactly is cooking. Now it's cooking involves, it's, in, it's a principle that involves heat application. Anything that you're preparing that has heat applied to it is cooking. So let's take, for example, a sandwich. You have hot sandwich, you have cold sandwich. So you're gonna just put a cheese, cheese and bread. That's not cooking, you're preparing a sandwich. If you're going to grill that sandwich now, you have actually cooked the sandwich. Once you have applied heat to anything, you're cooking. What is heat? Now heat is the transfer of energy from one medium or object or an energy source to a medium or to another object rather. So heat involves energy and transference, okay? And this is now we're taking the foundation. We're starting at the bottom and we're going up to the top. When we talk about heat, there are two categories of heat. We have dry heat and we have moist heat. Now, dry heat refers to any cooking technique without the addition of moisture or liquid, steam. Moisture can come in the form of liquid 
and or steam. So no, the heat is not transferred without the addition of any of those things, okay? So that's a cooking technique you need to bear in mind. Dry heat is a cooking technique where the heat is transferred to the food item without the addition of moisture. And this technique typically involves high temperatures of about 300 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter. Now let's go back to moist heat. So moist heat cooking refers to any cooking methods where the water, liquid, or steam is added to transfer heat to the food. So now the difference between moist and dry heat is dry heat, you do not add any moisture. And the reason why you don't need to add any moisture is because moisture is already present in that food item that is being cooked. So the moisture that is present in that food item will basically assist in the cooking process once heat is applied to tenderize and cook the food versus moist heat where you actually add some amount of moisture to it. It could be liquid or steam. And the liquid comes in different forms. It comes in milk, comes in stock, comes in wine, comes in sauces. Different types of liquid can be added or the steam. And the steam is the water vapor that we get from the liquid. Now, we need a medium to transfer this heat. We need something to transfer this heat. And we look at conductors. When you're looking at conductors, you have two categories of conductors. You have a good conductor and you have a poor conductor. Now, good conductors are conductors that transfer the heat rapidly and efficiently. And also in being a good conductor, the heat is transferred to the food item. And such conductors or such good conductors tend to be metals and stones. And you can easily see that with the, the cooking utensils that you use or equipment, your pots, they tend to be made out of metals. And the poor conductors now, they conduct heat slowly and inefficiently. For example, glass, plastic, or air, still air. And what you also need to know, the difference between a poor and a good conductor is, the poor conductors tend to be insulators. They will hold the heat. They do not transfer the heat. The good conductors, they transfer heat. All right, why is cooking so important? Why do I need to know how to cook? Why do I need to employ cooking? Why do I need to apply heat to food? Why not just eat the, the raw vegetables and stuff that is provided here on earth? Why is it so important? Why do I need to cook food? Let's go now into the reasons. Now, cooking is extremely important. And not saying that, not discounting that you can't have raw produce, but cooking has its place. When you apply heat, you destroy harmful microorganisms. And that is very important because once there is any microbial growth or any presence of any, any microorganism present on food items, you know that there is food infection um, bound to take place. Some foodborne disease, a food, foodborne illness about to take place. So you really don't want that. You don't want the vomit in the diarrhea, the fever, not cute. All right? So we tend to go cooking because when we cook, the foods reach high temperatures, and these high temperatures, the bacteria, microorganisms cannot survive at high temperatures. We also cook to preserve food from decaying. Now, we know when it's Aki time, mango time, and they are in surplus. We have all of this in surplus. When you cook the foods, there are some, no, let me re rewind that. When you do not cook foods, it will continue to ripen in its raw state because you have enzymatic actions happening in the foods. And you leave it uncooked, it will just decay and waste. And why have that when you can preserve it? And in preserving it, let me go back to the ake. Most persons, they tend to boil it and then they freeze it. So they have it outside of season. They have it for whenever they want to use it at their disposal. But the main thing is that they preserve it from decaying. 
And we, uh, next one, we go to, it destroys natural toxins or poisons in food. And this is very important because there is a toxin that is found in red beans. And I believe it's called kidney bean lectin. This is a sugar protein and it's called glycoprotein. Now this toxin is also present in many other beans, broad beans for example, but its highest concentration is in red beans. And it's recommended, highly recommended I might add, to boil red kidney beans for at least 15 minutes to destroy the natural toxins that are present in it. And these natural toxins can also cause illnesses, foodborne illnesses. It aids, you cook food to aid in digestion. Now, some foods in its natural state, you know, it just really does kind of pass through your system. And because it's not as tender as you would want it. So it aids in digestion when you cook food, once the heat is applied, you know, it, it tenderizes and it softens cellular structure of items and makes it, way, it makes it easier to digest. And next one we have here, to make it easier to eat. Now when you're cooking, you need to remember that you're cooking for different age groups. So let's take a toddler, for example, or a child. When you cook for a child, you need to ensure that the food is easy to digest, yes, and it's also easy to eat. So when they're eating things like, for example, let's say apples, American apples, there's a lot of roughage that, will, that is a bit difficult for a toddler to eat. So sometimes when they cook it and they reduce it and they get apple sauces, it's much easier for that toddler to eat. Now let's look at some other reasons. It makes food more palatable, meaning your palate is at the roof of your mouth and everybody likes to eat nice food and they like when it tastes up their mouth. You know, my mother would have said she wants something nice to eat. So, you know, everybody enjoys that. So when you're eating, you're eating for, you know, you want the food to be pleasing to the palate. You want pleasure when you're eating food, literally. And so when you're eating, you need to ensure for food, food items, it's encouraged that you cook it because cooking enhances the palatability of the food. And cooking also enhances flavor of the food. You know, when you're cooking, you have your version of stew chicken, I have my version of stew chicken. So you add your own thing and you never know, you may be creating some magic, some million dollar plan right there with a recipe, a, a, a famous recipe for stew chicken. So you add a little bit of this, you add a little bit of that, and you have your own version of whatever it is that you like to make. And cooking facilitates, it allows that. It adds variety to the diet. Nobody likes plain old gin. Ain't nobody like eating the same thing over and over and over. So cooking allows it, facilitates for variety. One day you feel for stewed chicken, maybe another day you feel for a raw salad. So you have that can play around. It reduces bulk. When you have green leafy vegetables, say for example, callaloo, pak choy, when you, cook, when you cut it up in its raw, in its natural state, it's bulky, it's big. Once heat is applied, it loses moisture and it comes right down. So cooking assists in reducing bulk. And cooking helps to process foods. A cake is not a cake until heat is applied. A sauce is not a sauce unless heat is supplied. Well, well most sauces. And so baked goods, breads, what we love to eat. National wouldn't have a job if they didn't, have, <laughs> if they didn't cook breads. All right, so if you can think of any other reason, write it down, make note of it. And when you go back to class, ask your teacher. Once you can justify your reason and your cause, by all means, ensure that you add it. All right? Now, we have looked at some definition of terms. We have looked at the foundation. We have looked at um, jargons, terminologies related to principles of cooking. But really and truly, what does all, what all of those definitions have to do with how heat is transferred to food? So we're going to watch this video and we're going to see if we can get some understanding of how heat is transferred to food.
cooking and heat transfer. Heat is a kind of energy that everything has. Heat will be transferred from something that has a lot of heat energy to something that has less heat energy. If you put an egg into hot water, the egg will get hotter and the water will get a little cooler because some of the water's heat energy is being transferred into the egg. There are many ways of imparting heat into the foods we cook, which are affected by two factors, the kind of heat and the moisture used in the cooking process. There are three kinds of heat, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is the transferal of heat through direct contact. When you place a steak on a hot pan, heat will transfer from the pan directly into the steak. Conduction is a rapid method of transferring high heat into foods, but can overcook the outside of the food before the inside has reached the right temperature. Convection is the indirect transfer of heat into a food through a medium. A medium is something that transfers the energy from the heat source into itself and then passes it onto the food. This is usually air, water or oil. An oven heats the air inside it. The air then transfers the heat into the food. The main difference between conduction and convection is that conduction transfers heat through solid objects while convection transfers heat through a liquid or gas. Lastly, there is radiation which is very different to conduction and convection because it doesn't need to make any contact with the food in order to transfer heat. When something gets very hot, it radiates heat as waves. You can feel the heat of a flame without actually touching it. This is because it is giving off radiant heat. The waves of radiant heat will continue traveling outward until it comes in contact with an object, at which point the wave is absorbed as heat. The ability to penetrate food varies between each of these types of heat, so you must consider this when choosing a cooking method. Now let's look at the effect that moisture has on the cooking process. Liquids are able to transfer heat much more effectively than air because they make better contact with the food and therefore have more opportunity to transfer their heat. Liquids can penetrate into the food and add flavor and moisture. Liquids will impair your ability to brown food. Water has a maximum temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. Hotter than that, and it will turn to steam. So when we cook, we need to decide if it will be more suitable to use dry heat, wet heat, or some other kind of heat, such as microwaves, as this will have a major impact on the finished dish. All right, very informative video, very informative video. Now we're going to be looking at each of these heat transference methods individually, just to cement what the video showed. We're going to start with conduction. So just like the video said, so conductive heat transfer happens when two solids touch each other or there's some physical contact. Now, the heat is transferred to the solid item. And once there is some touch, once there's some touch on the item, then you know that conduction is happening. Once you're touching the solid item, conduction is happening. And you can see it right here with the arm touching the handle of the pot. So that is conduction right there. And before, well, I'm going to use another analogy to kind of show you what this is, but I'll show you that closer down to the end, or explain that rather closer down to the end. So that's conduction. Now let's look at convection. Now, convection is the circular motion that happens when warmer air or liquid rises, while the cooler air or liquid drops. Now, from primary school, when you're learning about condensation and the water cycle, we learn about hot air rising and cold air falling. And that happens with the circular as it rises, falls, until everything, 
all the air is evenly distributed with the heat source or the heat that needs to be provided for the item to be cooked. Now this diagram here, it has water, the cool water at, top, at the top, it's going to fall and it's gonna sink as the hot air rises. And that you can easily see that too when you're boiling some liquid, you start to see tiny bubbles coming up first with the simmering and then a rapid boil comes. When the rapid boil is coming, that's when you know that the entire, the heat is evenly distributed in the liquid. And that's a main reason to why they tell you that when you're baking, when you're baking, you need to preheat the oven so that you can have an even air distribution when you are baking. When you put the item in it, the item is going to be baked at an even temperature. If you don't do that, then oftentimes you'll have burnt parts of the cake. The inside is not cooked and the outside is burnt, a little bit burnt, a little bit overdone, all right? Now let's look at radiation. Just like the diagram said, not the diagram, just like the video said, radiant heat, it doesn't need any medium to transfer it to anything. It's going to take the heat from the direct, the direct source. So it's the transfer of heat from one point to another without the aid of a medium. It passes through space or a vacuum and the just like the video said, it's the micro waves that are going, the micro, the radiant waves that are going, that is going to make contact with the item that is being cooked. Now, I want to kind of go back a little bit and cement all of this. I know, well, my students, for example, my fifth form students, and even some of the CAPE students, sometimes they have difficulty really understanding and cementing the different types of heat transfers. So they say, me, sometimes I get confused. I don't know the difference between conduction con and radiation or convection. Once you get conduction, solid to solid. Convection, it's passed through air or a liquid medium. Now I'm gonna use a car, for example. Your parents, if they carry you somewhere, carry to your pa wherever they carry you, carry you to school, and your parents is there. Your parents are there for a while, and the car you went in air condition, you went into an air conditioned car, and it's parked into the sun, and they leave. They're there for about an hour. Now, oftentimes when you go back to that car, just by touching the door handle, you know you, you come back a little bit. Now that is conduction. You are the solid item, and the car is the solid item. That's conduction, solid to solid. Radiation is the source from the sun. When those, the, the waves come down, it heats the car and the car absorbs that heat. Now, when you open that door and that heat wave just kind of lick you from inside, that's convection because it's the air now inside. As the hot air rises, the cold air is falling and that is the air that you get, that hot air. So that one car right there, so you're experiencing all the different types of heat transference in that one simple scenario. So now let us, I hope that helps, to un, um, that will help you to understand a little bit more. Conduction is physical and just like it said with the conduction, if you are going to say, for example, you're going to fry some bacon. You're gonna put bacon in a saucepan or not saucepan, into a skillet or a frying pan. The bacon is a solid item and the frying pan is a solid item. That is conduction that is happening right there. There is no liquid that is added, so that is conduction. Now we're gonna use the egg, like the video said, the boiling, um, to boil an egg. Once you put the egg in the liquid, the heat, the, the water is going to get cooler, you know. And it's the same thing with oil. Oh, let me not even use the egg since they had egg. Let me use something else. Let me use fried chicken. So you're going to fry chicken. They say allow the oil to reach the temperature that you want. Once you fry pieces of chicken in there, and they say don't overcrowd the pot, you'll read recipes that say don't to put too much pieces of chicken in the pot because it's going to drop the temperature way too much. The reason why it's going to drop the temperature way too much because the... It is the, the, the food item, which is the chicken, is pulling the heat from the oil. It's pulling it. So as it's pulling the heat from the oil, the oil's temperature is going to fall. And oftentimes when you take out whatever it, it has been fried, you have to allow the oil to come back up to its temperature because it has fallen. All right? So now let us kind of just put...
put all of this together so you realize how important it was for me to take you from the known to the unknown, to start from the foundation, which is the definitions of terms, the reasons why we cook food. Because if you don't know all of this, now the application of the heat source and how exactly it is done is going to be foreign to you because I'm going to be using jargons and words that you will not understand. And I, I deliberately did it this way because students, I want to encourage you when even as you're answering questions, CSEC questions or any other kind of questions, try and start from what you know. Start from the foundation, scribble your definitions and stuff like that. Those will help you to apply it and you use words in its correct context when you're asked to describe, explain, outline. So you state and whatever you state, you're going to apply it now to the unknown. All right. So let me kind of just put all of this into perspective. Now, with this final diagram, you'll see everything happening. We see the radiant heat coming off. And with this radiant heat, radiant heat you'll see which, is, which are the waves that was said earlier, the radiation, the radiant waves, the microwaves that are coming off. Sometimes when you're right beside the pot, where the heat source is, you either have to move the pot over or you have to put use um, pot holders or oven mitts because the heat source is so strong. Sometimes that's hotter than the, the actual pot because you're in, you're in line with direct heat. Now it comes up, it warms the pot. And there's one thing I want to um, also mention to you. Earlier we spoke about materials that are good conductors and materials that are insulators. Now, the good conductors, I want you to realize that and observe your pots. Observe your parents' pots at homes. When you look at the base or the bowl of the pot, you'll realize that that is metal. And it's metal because it's a very good conductor of heat. You want that metal area there so to heat quickly and rapidly to transfer the heat to the food item. And you'll notice that the handle, it's not always the same material. Sometimes the handle is made of hard plastic. Sometimes it has a rubber coverage or any other kind of material which are poor insulators. So while those insulators will trap heat, it will not transfer the heat, making it very safe to touch. Now, the ones that go right throughout, now those are the ones that will get really hot and you have to be mindful of it. That's why we invented pot holders and oven mitts. It's the same concept with bakeware too as well. Well, the difference is that the bakeware, you really need oven mitts for that because the entire thing is going to get hot. Now, continuing right here, in the, in the, with the liquid right here, this is conve convection that is happening. The hot air is rising and the cold air is falling. The hot air is rising and the cold air is falling. And it's the same concept with the vapor. If you were to put a lid on this, you would see the condensation on, on the lid. Or if you were to use a particular method of cooking that involves water vapor, and that water vapor will go up and actually cook the food on top. Now, it has advantages, they have disadvantages. Some persons prefer conduction because they like the caramelization and the browning of food before they actually go to add any kind of liquid to it because that now will seal the actual moisture that is present in the food item that is being cooked. So you're going to brown stew chicken or even curry chicken. You put it in some persons do it without oil. Some persons add oil, like a very, very little oil, just that it don't stick. But it depends on the type of pot that you're using because you have non-stick pots and you have other types of pots. All right, so they put it and they like that caramelization that is happening on the meat, that browning effect that is happening on the meat. And when they do that, when they actually add the liquid now, that caramelization acts as a barrier, somewhat to say, to hold the meat structure in place so that when you cook it, it's not coming like threads. You know, it's not separating like thread. It has structure and it has bite. And Jamaican culture, we love cooked meat that way. Trust me. We love brown meat first. So that is what is cultural to us that we like. We don't tend to like the separation of it. And if you look at it versus when you're making soup, 
And, think, and if you really, really think about it, if you're eating chicken soup versus brown stew chicken, you'll realize that the, the protein has a different bite to it because of the method of cooking and the type of heat that was applied. So when you use moist heat now, when there is some liquid applied, that moisture is going to penetrate and change the texture of the food because there will be some absorption of that moisture, especially if you're going to use that liquid to as part of the meat. For example, mm, stew peas. That, it does change the texture versus if you were to make, you know, I see this dish going around very popular now. I think I'm going to try it one day in a barbecue pig steel. I see barbecue pig steel becoming a thing now and versus pig steel in stew peas or even red pea soup. When I look at the pictures, they have two different textures. I'm, I'm assuming the, meth, the type of heat that was applied played a very important role in that. So the convection, convection, put this, just put it somewhere in your head. Convection, liquid, liquid air, liquid air, liquid air. Conduction, solid to solid, solid to solid, solid to solid. Radiation, direct, straight, 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 straight radiant waves, microwaves, direct contact to a heat source. So once you're coming, say for example, you have, you're going camping and you have a bonfire and you're roasting marshmallows. Now that is a radiant heat and you have to use a poor conductor or an insulator, which I normally give you a wooden, a wooden stick or even just regular stick. And you use that because if you were to put that where the fire is and that heat and that piece of stick hole in all of that heat is going to transfer to your hand. And when it transfers to your hand, what type of heat is that? Conduction. That's right. Conduction. So now that you have all of this now, what these types of heat, trans, what, what, what these types of heat, different types of transference of heat have to do with method of cooking? How do they, how do they connect? Where is the integration of both of them? Methods of cooking, hmm, I wonder what does that mean? Now listen, for methods of cooking, you'll have to come back for our next lesson to see what methods of cooking is all about, okay? So tune in for our next lesson. So we're gonna have continuation. We're gonna have a continuation now with what was and what we're going to do next week. But before we wrap up today's lesson, let's do a quick recapitulation, all right? I want you to remember that KWL sheet that you had. Remember that you had a slot to fill out what it is that you have learned. Now is a very good time to put in what it is that you have learned. And if there were things that were not addressed that you wanted to learn, put an asterisk beside it. Make sure you do some additional reading on your own. Make sure that you go back to see what it is that you will need to ask your teacher about or you need some clarity on. That way you can easily kind of steer yourself in the right direction as to what is required of you. And I should also let you know that today's topic was taken from section seven of the CXC syllabus. So, we looked at definition of terms. We looked at, we looked at six terms related to principles of cooking. We looked at what is cooking, heat, the different types of heat and the different mediums in which heat is transferred. And that is what we call conductors. We looked at the reasons why we cook food. I believe it was about nine reasons or so. And we, I also encouraged you that if you had additional reasons to add, make note of it. Make note of those reasons. And then I am encouraging you, please ask your teacher, challenge yourself. Think of a reason way out there as you think why persons would need to cook food. Challenge yourself and ask your teacher, justify your reason. Once you can justify your cause, you're good to go. And trust me, this is what CXC is looking for, justification. Justification, always prove yourself when you're answering your questions. We also looked at how exactly are these different types of heat transferred. So we looked at conduction, we looked at radiation, and we looked at convection. 
And though they are not in isolation, like you by yourself, you by yourself, you have in one method of cooking, you can have all three principles of heat being applied to the food. So you just need to know which is which. So conduction is solid to solid. The heat is being transferred when two solids touch each other. That's what you need to remember. When two solids touch each other, conduction, the conductive heat is, is, is being transferred. That is what is happening. Convection is when you have the heat is being transferred from a medium to another. And the, that medium tends to happen in a circular motion and it happens with air or liquid. Remember, when hot air rises, cold air falls. And when that cold air falls, it's just the cold air is going to continue falling until all of that cold air has been circulated. And once that, circula once that circulation happens where everything, all the heat is evenly distributed, then you know that that water has reached the temperature in which it needs to reach. All right? In the... Earlier, I said that conduction is tend to happen with higher temperatures. Conduction tends to happen with higher temperature, and it's a, it, it tends to happen quicker than convection because remember, with convection, you're using air or liquid when you're using solid to solid. So the pot will get hotter or hot, get hotter quicker than the liquid that, or the air that is being used to transfer the heat. And it's the same thing in the oven. The oven, when that hot, when the heat, when the gas is turned on, you turn on the oven, there's a fan inside of it, and that fan circulates the air. Hot air comes up, cold air falls. Hot air comes up, cold air falls. And now with radiation, which I believe it's the easiest one out of the three to remember, it's just a direct heat source. It's the transference of heat from one point to the other. They don't need any medium. It's just using the direct heat source from one medium to another. So once you turn on that gas stove, and you, if you don't have, if you can go outside and have a, a wonderful barbecue or even a, um, a campfire, you, I do it with my son all the time. I just turn on the gas stove and I use some chopsticks and I just put some marshmallow on it and that is radiation. It's from the direct heat source. Sometimes you turn it on and you feel the heat coming off. And sometimes if you look closely at the heat, you'd see like some waves kind of coming off. You know, you can know that the heat is very much alive and well coming out of it. All right. So I hope today has been a wonderful day for you. I hope you learned something today. And I really, really, really encourage you to use that KWL form every single time. All right. So that's where we leave it for today. If you have any questions, don't be shy about it. Reach out to us through TVJ's social media pages and we will be happy to answer. Now we shift gears to Cape Studies. Class time continues with Sociology for Grade 13 after this break. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited.